right, good evening everyone. Welcome to our Sunday evening worship service. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in if you're on Facebook Live. Uh, had a good service this morning. We've got another uh, message for you this evening from the book of Ruth, chapter 4. We're going to conclude it next week and then we'll dive off into another Sunday in a couple weeks from now. And so uh, I'm looking at several different pathways we can take there and uh, follow up with, with what we've been studying in the book of Ruth. It's been a rich study. It's been a great study. And uh, we're going to explore uh, just the, the concluding comments and, and the, the rest of the story tonight. And so I hope you have your Bibles tonight and you're ready for that. Uh, several events coming up this week. Uh, the Aspire Women's event. This is your last evening to get... Uh, your money's in for that if you're looking to go for it. Don't forget we're having uh, the Lord's Supper next Sunday during our Sunday morning service. And so uh, all of that information is in the bulletin, should be on the website, uh, all the other events that we got going on. Hey, if you are tuning in through social media, we want to thank you so much for joining us. I don't, I don't usually do this, but I want to acknowledge our social media crowd. I know we got some faithful followers there and uh, we appreciate your support. It, and I always encourage people that are here to, to take the invitations that we have prepared and uh, invite their neighbors and their friends. And there's something you can do to help us as well. If you're tuning in through uh, Facebook Live or tuning in through our website, share that with the people that you know. Like our posts and then share our posts so others will see. That will expand our social media platform. Uh, also, for those of you here and for those of you tuning in, pray for our social media platform as well. Hey, look, if we truly believe that the Word of God is the Word of God, God says in His Word that so shall my Word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return void. That's whether it's preached or recorded live or recorded and listened to through social media. Uh, God's Word will go out and accomplish in whatever means and whatever ways that we can promote it. So be praying for that social media platform and the people that are tuning into our website that their hearts will be reached, their lives will be changed, and uh, we will continue to grow through that. So that's just a couple of different ways that you can help us. Uh, VBS is coming up. Those posts are out. We'll be refreshing those every couple of weeks. Uh, when you see one of those, make sure you share it as well so that message will get out. Uh, they can go live to our website and they can register online there or they can come by the office and pick up a registration form, uh, fill it out, return it in. We'll get their kids registered. I think the invitations to ones that normally come to VBS have already been mailed out or they will be in the near future. So uh, all that information is going out. Uh, wind shape camps, uh, several other training events coming up. We will have a training event here at our church in June. Uh, that'll be one month out from the camp. It is uh, later on in July when the camp actually takes place, the 24th through the 29th of July. And it will be over at the municipal auditorium. We're teaming up with several other churches here in the Morgan City area. Uh, Morgan City is one of five cities throughout the state of Louisiana uh, that this camp is going to be um, presented at. Uh, the owner of Chick-fil-A, Truett Cathy, uh, he has founded these camps and uh, the city is supporting it. Uh, we're looking for sponsors to help out with scholarships, snacks, and so forth, and I'll be getting that information to you as we go along and get closer to camp time. But the flyers for it uh, are out in the for you as well. If you're looking to help out with a scholarship or sponsorship, let me know and I'll let you know how you can be involved in that as well. Let's get started with our worship service tonight with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for all that you're doing, uh, both here and throughout the world, Lord God. For some people, it seems like uh, things are falling apart, but for those of us who believe, we know that everything is falling into place. And uh, we just thank you, Lord God, that you've allowed us to be a part of that plan. And as we move about our, our day-to-day uh, adventures, Lord God, and the things that we do on a regular basis, help us to be mindful of people who are looking for answers. Uh, Lord, we know what this world is coming to, and we also know what this world is not coming to, and that they're not coming to Jesus. And so help us to point them to the one true hope uh, that they have in Jesus Christ. 
the answer to all of their problems. And uh, we just pray for tonight, Lord God, as we open up your word. I pray that you'll open up our minds and our hearts as we look at uh, the kinsman redeemer and Boaz and uh, how he relates to you as our true redeemer uh, of our heart and our soul and our salvation. We just turn this service over to you, Lord God. We praise you in advance for what you're going to do and how you're going to speak to us and speak through us. We just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. of the Lord healing the paralytic and I think it's um, fitting when we think of Ruth that what happened when when Jesus healed the paralytic uh, it says in verse 12 of Mark 2 they were all amazed and I think about Ruth's life and how the Lord provided so many ways and I said, I just, I don't know that we acknowledge the amazement in our lives with other people about what the Lord has done. So I'm going to ask you to think about that as we sing this song, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. And think about sharing something that the Lord has done in your life with someone as you come in contact with people tomorrow. Would you stand? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and his soul shall I so much. Be seated. In Galatians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 the scripture tells us grace and peace to you from our God from the God our Father the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sake to ransom us from this present evil age and again, I think about Ruth being brought out. Of, she followed her mother-in-law out of that land and was brought into a new place and was totally taken care of. Just God provided so many things for them. And again, again, to God be the glory for what he has done. Are we praising him? Are we thanking him for the, everything he's provided? Are we sharing? I think probably when you think about, well, you know, I, I, really, don't th I really don't think I have that much. Wait, are you breathing? Did you get up this morning? 
did you go through your day without any real catastrophes or any real problems? To God be the glory. He has us taken care of. Think about it. To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved in the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin. is what it's all about. Great things he has done. In Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Can you say that? His love endures forever. For how long? Amen. That's really what happens. Redeemed. That's what we are. Redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. child and forever I am. 
I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is a theme of my song. Redeemer. The process of redemption. Most of the times when we think of redemption, we think of uh, maybe getting even or setting the score straight. Uh, in some sense, that is true, but not in this sense. Um, the kinsman redeemer uh, acquiring something that could possibly rightfully be his from the beginning. Uh, we'll find out in the case of Boaz and Ruth and Naomi, uh, there was one person standing in the way of making this uh, fairy tale story kind of come to fruition. Uh, there was another person who was next in line before Boaz that this right was rightfully belonging to. Um, Y'all know we, we like to play our games from time to time. We love to play skip bow on game night around here. Uh, there's usually some pretty good... Uh, uh, rounds that break out, I guess you want to call it that. Uh, you've heard me talk about our family night when we play Monopoly, how it can get kind of, kind of intense from time to time. There's another game that we used to play back when we were going uh, as a large group to Dry Creek. Uh, one of our favorite pastimes there was to stay up late at night after we had done all the kids and the camp activities, and we as adults would kind of debrief for the day, and then when the debriefing was over with, the dominoes and the, the cards would come out. And one game that we really grew fond of playing, we even played it uh, on several other large gatherings, uh, was a game called Liverpool Rummy. How many of you ever played that? You ever heard of it? Never heard of it? So I think there's actually like a deck of cards that is assigned to each player that participates in the game, and there's a minimum of seven of eight players it can be quite uh, large from time to time, a lot of cards involved. Uh, I actually seen the group that we play with, they have these little spring-loaded plastic clips that you can put your cards in and it spreads out like a big fan and it's almost like you got this, this whole handful of cards by the time the, the game is over with. So there's a different set that you have to try to acquire for each hand. It's not the same from hand to hand. One, one set you might have to have uh, three of a kind. One set you might have to have four of a kind. One set you might have to have a run of six. Some of them you might have to have certain cards for certain times, so it varies from time to time. You gotta keep up with the rotation as it goes. But as the game progresses around the table, when the person says I can no longer play and they discard theirs, that's when the excitement begins because it could just be that this card that they're discarding is something that somebody around the table needs. And it could be something that multiple people need to complete their set. So if you have two or three people that's trying to complete the exact same set, that's going to be the hot item when it hits the table. However, that card rightfully belongs to the person who's next in turn. And so that was my catchphrase when I began playing the game because a lot of people, boy, they'd slap that card. That's mine. I want it. I need it. And I'd say, uh-uh, that, that is rightfully mine because I'm next in turn. You'll get your turn in just a minute. If I don't need it, then it becomes yours. And so that was kind of the catchphrase of mine as we began playing that. And they started picking at me because, uh-uh, that's rightfully Tracy's. Don't take his card. It's not your turn. You can't have that one. 
And so that becomes the case here with Boaz. Uh, Ruth and Boaz finally meet. Uh, she is looking for him to be the kinsman redeemer because they know that there are some connections with their families here. But Boaz, being the statesman that he is, wants to do things according to the law. We've shared the law of how the, the kinsman redeemer was set up to carry on the lineage of someone whose husband is possibly deceased how that could be uh, continued on through the family line. And so that's what happens in this case. Boaz says there may be another one. He says, let me check and make sure. And sure enough, there is someone that they have to approach. And so then once they get over that obstacle, the kinsman redeemer can make the purchase of land required for that to continue on. So as we pick up the story in chapter 4, we're going to go verses 1 through 12, and we'll wrap it up uh, next week. But before we begin, let's look back at the statement that Naomi made uh, to Ruth back in chapter 3, verse 1. Let's talk about, you know, what was Naomi's intention for Ruth? Why was she trying to set up this match made in heaven is literally what it was because God was orchestrating this whole scenario to preserve the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, we see that in a couple of the different Gospels when we look at the genealogy of Jesus. These two names are mentioned in his lineage, in his genealogy. So what was Naomi trying to do? Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 says that, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you? that it may be well with you. So Naomi was doing more than just trying to set her up with Boaz uh, as a husband-to-be. Uh, there was a lot more to it than that. As her mother-in-law, she was trying to provide her with security. Ruth being a Moabite, Naomi being an Israelite, and Boaz being an Israelite, Naomi was trying to provide for Ruth a permanent home and to become an Israelite as well and become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and be a uh, follower of God because that was one thing that Ruth said. He said. She said, wherever you go, that's where I'll go. Your home will be my home and your God will be my God. And so Naomi was trying to preserve for Ruth a permanent home now that her husband Naomi's son had passed away. So with that as well, Naomi was trying to provide for Ruth a future. Maybe Naomi sensed that her days on the earth were coming to a close. And she said, after I'm gone, I want to make sure that not just your family, but you as well can continue on uh, with this security and with this permanent home. Perhaps Naomi was trying to provide for Ruth a peace of mind because Ruth was constantly worried about how am I going to provide for myself? How am I going to provide for my mother-in-law in this land that we're, we really don't fit, fit in as widows? We don't have that many rights as widows. So maybe Naomi, Naomi was trying to give Ruth a peace of mind through all of this as well. So Naomi was also trying to provide for her an inheritance. She was trying to provide for Ruth an inheritance that she no longer had because not only had her husband passed away, but her father-in-law had passed away. She had no relatives basically right there except for her relatives back in the land of Moab. She was also trying to provide for Ruth relief from her poverty. Boaz was not a poor man. He was a wealthy man. He was a landowner. He had crops. He had servants. He had everything that could relieve Ruth and Naomi of their poverty that they were in as well. So here's one thing that I want you to think of as we consider those concepts. So when you share your faith with someone, what is the overall goal that you have in mind for that person? What is it that you're trying to provide for them when you share your faith? What is it that you have in mind? You say, I, I want this to happen in this person's life. What, are, what is your objective when you begin to share your faith? Are, are you trying to provide them with simply a place to attend church? Or are you trying to help them find an eternal home in heaven? 
Or are you trying to help that person become a better person? Or are you trying to help that person become a child of God? Think about that with the concept of what Naomi's trying to provide for Ruth. Or are you trying to help that person gain more knowledge about the Bible? That's a good thing. That's a necessary thing. Or are you trying to help that person understand who Jesus is? So that was one of the things I challenged our new believers with several weeks ago. You know, who is Jesus to you? Because that's something you as a believer has to co- have to come to grips with. Who, who is Jesus to me? I got to know who Jesus is to me before I can explain to another person who Jesus could be to them as well. So Naomi knew who her, her God was, and she wants now Ruth. She want, I want, Ruth, I want you to know who my God is. I want you to know why I worship this God. I want you to see all these events unfold him. I want you to see him in his providential care and what he's doing. And Ruth is going to get to experience that firsthand. So when you share your faith with someone, are you looking to make them a church member or are you trying to make them a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? So those are some things that we need to consider. Uh, and, and I got to looking at that, you know, when I looked at that comment back at what Naomi told her, she said, I, I, I want to seek security for you that it may be well with you. Was she talking about just her security while she was here on this earth? Or was she more concerned about her eternal security? So are we bought with a price? The redemption of us, uh, we are bought with a price. Uh, was Ruth, was this option rightfully Boaz's? Not necessarily, but Boaz goes through the proper procedures to ensure that what he's about to do is his rightful standing in the line of the kinsman redeemer. So as we look at Boaz as a type of Christ, uh, there are several things that our kinsman redeemer, our redeemer of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kinsman and redeemer of Reduth, Ruth uh, does for us. Uh, we see in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4 that our kinsman redeemer pleads, his case, pleads our case. Just as Boaz is going before the people of the city, the Lord Jesus Christ pleads our case as well. Pick it up in verse 1, we see, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Imagine that. What a coincidence. Just the fellow that they needed to see. They're sitting there at the city gate, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, well, here he is, the guy, the exact guy that we need to talk to. Hey, buddy, come over here. Let, let's talk about a situation that we got at hand. Isn't God good? Doesn't he orchestrate things at just the right time, at just the right place? So Boaz said, come aside, friend. Sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down and he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. Boaz is saying, this option is rightfully yours. Just like that card was for the next in turn in the game of Liverpool Rummy. Everything that, that has dropped in Boaz's lap, he says, it's not rightfully mine. It, my friend, it is rightfully yours. And being an honest man of God, being an honest businessman, being the statesman that I am, I don't want to overstep my boundaries. I want to make sure that it's presented to you the way that it should be and I want to let you know, you don't know about any of this. Maybe you haven't gotten wind of it, but I want to let you know that this option is here. It's yours for the taking. I'm going to step back, and I'm going to let you decide where we go from here. 
And so he agrees to it. He says, I will redeem it. However, there's a catch-22. There's one thing standing in the way that Boaz hasn't covered yet. This friend is not named. And in the Hebrew, when it talks about friend, it actually refers to someone being old so-and-so. So we really don't have this guy's name, but old so-and-so says, oh, this, this sounds like a really good business transaction. I've got the opportunity to buy this piece of land with no strings attached, and then Boaz drops the bomb on him. Well, here's the catch, buddy. This may be the part that you don't like. He says, I, I will redeem it. I want the land. But then Boaz says, on the day... You buy the field from the hand of Naomi. You must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetrate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative, old so-and-so, he says, I, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Imagine that. God's working out another situation there. Not only did the old so-and-so come by at just the right time at just the right place, but his life is in such a way that he can't possibly redeem this without messing up everything that he has going on in his life. So now the option falls back to Boaz, and Boaz has taken every step possible, and he's covered all the bases to make sure that this is his rightful opportunity to redeem Ruth and Naomi and buy this piece of property. So notice how intentional that Boaz becomes as he pleads his case and the right to redeem Ruth. All of this reveals that Boaz, it shows his power, it shows his position, it shows his presence, and it shows his purpose. He says, I have the power to buy it. I've got the money to buy it, but it's not rightfully mine. He's showing his position as well. He says, your position is, is first in line. Mine is second in line. It shows his presence because he has, he's well known in the town. He gives, gathers these city officials together pretty easily to plead his case. But it also shows his purpose to do it in a rightful manner and in a God-honoring manner. So here's how this compares with Jesus being our Redeemer. Jesus knows the helpless, hopeless situation that we are in apart from him. And as we attempt to secure our eternal destination on our own, he ensures that he has everything in order to make us his own. So Jesus lives the life. That is worthy. He sheds the only blood that can cleanse us of our sins. And he makes a way for us to approach the Father. And then he seals our redemption with the Holy Spirit. They go through the whole process. They go through all the formalities. Boaz and old so-and-so. That They go through everything that they need to to cover this situation. So write this down in, the, in your margin or on your notes if you're using the outline, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 31. When we think about our redemption, when we think about uh, how Jesus pleads for our case, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 35 says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. He's pleading our case right now. And even before you surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, even before you were redeemed, Jesus was saying, that one is mine. That one is rightfully mine, and that's the one that I want to give an inheritance to. He makes intercession for us. Just like Boaz was making intercession for Ruth and Naomi, 
to properly redeem them, he goes before the city officials, he pleads his case, and he intercedes on their behalf. And that's what God, uh, that's what Jesus does for us. He's at the right hand of the Father. He says, Father, this one's mine. I've earned the right to redeem this person. I've shed my blood. I've gone through all the proper procedures. And now I want to make sure that they have an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. Write down this verse, Hebrews chapter 7. You can turn there if you're quick enough, but write, make sure you write it down. Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. And there are uh, and also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Friend, that means he is pleading for our case constantly. He's saying, God, that is rightfully mine. I shed my blood. I paid for their redemption with my blood. I've lived my life sinless and spotless for their redemption. And now that one rightfully belongs to me. And so the friend that was approached by Boaz seemed interested in the possession of the land, but not the responsibility of marrying Ruth. We don't know all the details, but we do know that God orchestrated the situation to where this guy quickly backs out and allows Boaz the right, and Boaz pleads his case before the city officials and makes everything technically right for him to be able to go through with this kinsman redeemer role. If you think about all that has worked thus far to, to come to this, this point in time and for this little detail to work out, it, it's mind-boggling to think about what all God has providentially put in place for this to happen. The next thing I want you to see is that at Boaz is the kinsman redeemer and Jesus is our redeemer. He purchased our redemption. Not only did he plead for our case, not only did Boaz plead for their case, but he purchased their redemption as well. In verse 7 and 8 it says, Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. I couldn't find any explanation over the sandal, why it was so significant. It was just kind of a weird situation for me. I, I don't know how you'd walk around the rest of the day. I don't know if they had an extra pair waiting for them when they got home, what the deal was. But he paid the rightful price. He went through with it. He did everything according to the law to make this transaction work. And now Boaz has got the green light to go through as a kinsman redeemer, just like God set it up as. But he purchased our redemption. Boaz did everything properly to purchase the redemption of Ruth and Naomi in this situation. Write down this verse, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. We're going to look at a lot of different scriptures that, that go along with this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, 
that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Jesus didn't have to use no sandal. He didn't have to buy no parcel of land. He didn't have to pay money. He paid with his blood. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Not out of his riches, but according to his riches. But he has purchased our redemption. He has done everything. He has pleaded our case. And he has paid for our redemption with his own shed blood. The next thing we see is that he proclaims that we are his. Not only did Boaz plead his case before the city official and the actual next of kin, not only did he purchase their redemption, but he also proclaimed that these are now his. In verse number 9, it says that Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimonex and all that was Chileans and Malins from the hand of Naomi. He proclaimed, he said, I did it. I, I purchased it. I bought it. This is what I wanted. This is what I wanted to happen from the beginning. And now your witnesses this day, I'm proclaiming to you that I have bought everything that was necessary to become the kinsman redeemer for Ruth and Naomi. And so he proclaimed it publicly. He didn't try to hide it. He didn't try to cover it up. He didn't try to be sneaky about it. But he made it open and public before everyone around to make sure that everyone knew that I'm going through with this transaction. So that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died a public death. That's why he took a, took a beating in the open. That's why they had an open trial before Pontius Pilate. He says, I'm not going to do anything undercover. I'm not going to do anything in secret, but I'm going to do it publicly and openly. I'm going to let everybody know I'm dying for the sins of mankind just like my father sent me to do, just like I predicted I was going to do. And he proclaimed openly and publicly, I'm redeeming the sins of mankind with my shed blood. So as we think about that, why, why do we promote a public invitation at the end of the service? Why do we call people forward to say, if you want to make a decision to follow Christ, we want you to make it publicly and openly. We, we do baptisms to where everybody will know publicly and openly that this person has become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is it a means of identification and fulfilling the Great Commission, but it also publicly professes that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way that Boaz publicly proclaimed, hey, I, I am now their kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ did everything openly and publicly. We as believers are to do everything openly and publicly as well. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 33, Jesus says, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. Which is what Boaz is doing for Ruth and Naomi here. He said, I'm, I'm confessing publicly, and I'm now interceding for them, and I'm stepping in as their kinsman redeemer. Jesus said, whosoever shall confess me before me, and him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So not only does our kinsman redeemer, not only does our redeemer plead for our case, not only has he purchased our redemption, not only does he proclaim that we are his, but through all that, he preserves our prosperity. He preserves our prosperity. I'm not a prosperity preacher. Y'all know me better than that. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm talking about eternal riches and eternal rewards. I'm talking about an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not. It's not about material possessions at all. And I think for Boaz, it wasn't anything at all about the land. But he says, I want to step in and do something for these people that nobody else can do. I want to be obedient to the Lord. And I think Naomi was saying the same thing about the mother-in-law situation and being 
mother-in-law to Ruth. She said, I want to do something that's going to make an eternal impact for her that money can't buy. Boaz was trying to preserve the prosperity of their family lineage. Boaz had to purchase the land to secure Ruth's prosperity. He wasn't interested in more land. He had plenty of land. He had plenty of money. He had servants. He was interested in the well-being of Ruth. He could have most likely bought land any time that he wanted to from anyone that he wanted to. What he saw was a family in need and, that they, and what they could add to God's kingdom. And that added more benefit to his life and to their life as well. So Jesus is more interested in your soul than he is anything else. He's not worried about your possessions. He's not worried about your gifts, your talents. He can build his kingdom any way he wants to. He can build his church any way he wants to. He's more interested in your soul than he is anything else. He's more interested in your prosperity through all eternity and gaining riches that are incorruptible that this world can't corrupt. Jesus is especially more interested in what you can add to his kingdom. Anything that you can add to his kingdom, it's just a little bit extra for him. It's what we call lanyap. It's an extra added benefit. The bottom line is that we are his prized possession. That's why he has redeemed us. That's why he has pleaded for our case. That's why he's purchased our redemption. Because he wants to preserve our prosperity as a child of God. And he wants to give us riches that we just don't fully comprehend. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says this. It says, you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who were once not a people but are now a people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. That's the prosperity that God wants us to have. He wants us to have his riches in mercy, his marvelous light, his marvelous grace, and he wants to just lather his love upon us. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4 says, Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. He preserves our prosperity in everything that we do. So the next thing that we see that the kinsman redeemer wanted to do is that we become propagated into his family. Boaz wanted to have Ruth and Naomi propagated into his own family. Chapter, uh, verse 10, uh, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malan, I have acquired as my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren. And from his position at the gate, you are witnesses to this day. He said, I, I want to perpetuate the name of the dead. I want to make sure that their name continues on, that their lineage, their genealogy continues to exist. I want to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren. He's doing this for the honor of his relatives that have deceased and passed away. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we also, that's what God wants to do. He wants to give us that inheritance that is incorruptible, that does not fade away. And he wants to propagate us into his family at one time, you were distant from the Lord. You were not a child of God. You were at enmity with God. You were in darkness. You were a dead man walking. Him. But God said, through my mercy and my grace, I'm going to make you a part of my family. 
I'm going to graft you into my lineage. I'm going to adopt you as my own child. So that's what Boaz is doing here. Boaz is taking Ruth and grafting her in to God's family. Securing for her an inheritance. And so several uh, months ago, uh, I used the analogy of this little clipping of a plant that I have at my house. It was a piece that had broken off. I just took a cup of water and, and I stuck it down in that water and through the stem of that plant it started growing roots. And as those roots got bigger and stronger, I, I, I took it out of that cup of water and I found a little thing of pot and soil and, and potted it in and started blooming and growing real good. And I brought that as a demonstration to show you how Discipleship works. It starts off small. We, we get them rooted and grounded, and they begin to grow, and they begin to bloom, and they begin to blossom. I, I, basically, what I did was I propagated that plant. I found a way to take a piece off of that plant and help it to begin to grow on its own as well. And so now that plant, man, if you come to my house, it's sitting by the front door. That, that, that thing is about this big around. I've taken a couple of other clippings of it and propagated it as well. But basically what I've done is from one plant, I've started a whole new plant that's growing. It's beautiful. And I've had several people say, hey, man, I'm going to slip over there and cut a piece of that plant off because I want some. I say, I'll just give you one. Don't worry about taking it. And there's several other people who I've allowed to propagate this plant and begin growing on their own. So those of you who, who know anything about trees and plants and growing stuff, know that there are several different methods of propagation. You can start off with a seed. Uh, you can find a bloom or a flower that has seeds off of it. You can start another plant. You can propagate another plant like that. You can use the cutting method that I talked about just a moment ago. Or you can actually graft it into another plant. You can take the root stock of one tree and a clipping off another one and put the two of them together and graft it. So basically that's what Boaz is doing with Ruth. She's saying, Ruth, I want you to be grafted into God's family. And as your kinsman redeemer, I'm going to graft you into the lineage of my family. And we're going to see that family tree begin to grow. Now, whether they knew the Messiah was going to come from that grafting or that genealogy, I don't know. I don't know what God revealed to them. Israel is often known as the olive tree. It's referred to as the olive tree. And so in Romans chapter 11, Paul explains this technique of grafting and how the Gentiles, which the Moabites were, have been grafted into God's family. Romans chapter 11, this will be the last passage it will refer back to. Romans chapter 11 beginning in verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off that I may be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty but fear for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fail severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, talking about the Gentiles, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, uh, cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So basically, that's what Boaz is doing with Naomi. She said, he said, Naomi, uh, Ruth, you've been broken off. But your husband... Uh, your father-in-law, they're all deceased. But what I want to do is I want to take you and I want to graft you into my family. I want to graft you into God's family. And that's what Naomi's intention was. She said, I want to provide for you a security. And that's what Ruth's desire was too. She says, I want your God 
to be my God. I want your land to be my land. I want your family to be my family. And that's what this whole situation is about, is Ruth coming into a place where she really had no right or no place being, and these people welcoming her in and showing her the love of God in practical ways. And she began propagated into his family. And if you think about us, when we are born with a sinful nature, we have absolutely no right to be in God's family. And that's where, our, where Jesus steps in as our Redeemer. He says, I'm going to make every provision possible for you to become a child of God. Joint heirs with Christ is what we are. And so now every right and privilege that the Lord Jesus Christ has, he has redeemed us and allowed us to take part in those provisions as well. Isn't God good? Isn't it amazing the way he works those things out? And isn't this story amazing the way he has orchestrated this whole situation? How precious a soul must be if God is willing to go through all of this to provide an inheritance. And how amazing your soul must be as well. Because if you think about it, not just at the time of your conversion, but long before that, God was setting up that scenario to bring you to that point in time. People prayed for you. People might have witnessed to you. People might have invited you to church time and time again. Mom or grandma might have drug you to church time and time again. God was orchestrating all of that. And look at all that Ruth and Naomi went through. Ten plus years of wandering around, providing for their own. Not knowing where they were going to go, not knowing how it was going to end up. But all in all, God was orchestrating the situation for Ruth to come in and to become a part of this family and become a part of the, the nation of Israel and to become a part of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. How costly it was for Christ to purchase our redemption to make us his bride. We, the church, we are the bride of Christ that was purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said it best like this, How precious a soul must be when both God and the devil are after it. So all of this story... Uh, all of this that God has orchestrated in this story was not for us just to have a, a love story. It's here for a purpose. It was to preserve the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ and to ensure that everything was in order for our salvation. Now, if God had you and me in mind that long ago, because he was thinking about us when this story happened. He said, I've got to find a way to make sure that the Savior comes from this lineage. I've, I've got to get these two together to make this happen. And I'm doing it for the souls of mankind that aren't even born yet. If God had you and me in mind that long ago, don't you think he's interested in the details of our lives today? And if he can work out the details for all of this to take place, then working out the details in your life is no problem whatsoever. Father God, we love you so much, and uh, we just thank you for that we are bought with a price. We thank you for that precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the way that you orchestrate all of the details of our life, Lord God. God, I think about what you have done just in my life alone, and I know that there are stories probably much more complicated, much more greater than mine. But Lord, as we look at just these four chapters in the life of Ruth and Naomi and, and Boaz and what all you worked out there, Lord God, how, how mind-boggling it is, the details that you work out in our lives each and every day. Well, we, we don't know what you're working on right now. We don't know what's going to happen in the next day or two in our lives. We don't know what situation we may find our life in a week from now or a year from now, but you do. And we can rest each night knowing that as your beloved, 
as your bride, as your precious possession, as your prized possession, Lord God, you care about everything that goes on in our life. I, I thank you, Lord God, that you've propagated us into your family. You've allowed us to become children of God. I thank you that you've allowed us to let the name of Jesus Christ be known in our community. And I pray, Lord God, that as we consider the fact that we have been redeemed, we've been set free, we've been bought with a price, that we'll make that investment worthwhile, Lord God. That we'll go out and we'll tell others that there is a God that loves them, there's a God that has provided for them, and that there is a way out of the situation that they are in. Because their sins are covered the same way that ours is covered through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just thank you, Lord God, for the rest of the story. We thank you that it doesn't stop here, Lord God, but we can read all the way through the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ and just see how you've worked out in meticulous detail each and every step of the way for our Redeemer to come to this earth to show us kindness and to show us compassion, but most of all to show us that through his death on Calvary we can be set free. And we just thank you, Lord God, for all that you're going to do, and we thank you, Lord God, for all that you have already done. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We will.